like I said last week, it's, it's not fun stuff, but it's, it's stuff that I hope you can really, really use now, that instead of all this theory and this is how sales, uh, sales um, transition from, from uh, normal to abnormal and all that sort of thing, that's, you know, that's, that's one thing, but when you really can see how you're going to use it, that, that can make a huge difference. I really like this, um, this picture because of the central no biopsy. I mentioned that, that they, they, um, they take the substance, a blue dye, near the tumor. And then that's what that first picture is. And then, um, then the injected material is located visually and or with a device that detects radioactivity. And um, um, like I said, they used to have, have the woman lying on her stomach to do that. I don't know if there's a better way to do that now or not. That's the last I had heard that it's on a special table that they lie on their stomach so that the, the breast is sort of sort of free to, to um, be able to see where it, you're not, not um, constricting it or anything with the, um, the lymph flow. That's what we're after. Um, anyway, the first lymph nodes or lymph nodes that take up the material from the tumor area um, are, are considered to be the sentinel lymph node or nodes. And then they can be um, removed and looked at under the, the microscope. For the, you actually have to see the, the tissue histology. Gosh, these tables are closer together. I'm getting mm -hmm. huger or something. I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I have to be careful here. Okay, but anyway, that's, that's how you do that so that they don't have to actually sample um, every node in the axillary chain. Because there's a lot, a lot of lymph flow that you're going to be extracting and, and much more risk for lymphedema. So, anyway, um, okay, we, we kind of talked about the, the bras and everything, but the breast reconstruction, I do have that on the notes page there, so that, that's just kind of a kind of an um, interruption with this, this particular process. But anyway, um, it, it's up to the woman whether they, and sometimes a lot of, of it hinges on insurance too, but um, Medicare at least does approve of, of doing uh, reconstructive surgery for, um, for the breast. Well, partly because it can cause the, the back problems and everything, your, your weight's not even, especially somebody that has really, really large breasts, it it's can be a, a big problem. So. Um, Anyway, it, it is a problem that it deal makes, but um, because that's a that's a health issue too. When you have a poor body image, it, it does it can affect your health. It can affect your sexuality and, and just how you feel about yourself. When you feel like you can be assertive than you were, you can feel powerless and all that. When you feel like you've lost something that's it's a, a part of you. Um, I had a, a, a real, well, she was a real elderly woman. I think she had some kind of lymphatic cancer, um, you know, separate from the breast cancer that she had had um, about 10 years before. And and um, her husband was still alive at the time that she had her breast cancer surgery. And she was she was really bemoaning in the fact that she was going to have a mastectomy and that um, her husband was going to love her in or something like that. And, and so she said, are you going to even want to wouldn't touch me anymore or anything like that. And he said, Oh, don't worry about it. I like the other one better anyway. <laughs> so, you know, that, that was that was a really nice thing for the you know, the husband to to you know, the spouse partner or whatever to you know, to buy into the you know, you you are you and you know, your breast is not you and, and uh, that's a part of you and I understand that but I don't think that it's going to affect our relationship So I just thought that was that was really neat. Um, that's what's so fun about being a cancer nurse. That's what it is fun is that you get a lot of wisdom from a lot of people that, that have, have been through a whole lot of things. Some things are worse than cancer. So you can imagine that. But like a lot of our World War II veterans that were like at, at D-Day and stuff like that, it's like they, they didn't die then and they saw all these other people die and they're like, well, you know, I, I, every day I have had since then is just gravy. You know, this is nothing compared to what those people went through. So, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not worried about dying from cancer. So, so you, you just hear all kinds of um, ways that people handle the the issues with cancer. So, anyway, that you are actually seeing the, the real prostheses um, for the symmetry and all that sort of thing. Okay, now um, there, you can do a flap of skin or muscle or fat number site to the, the mastectomy for the, the person's own fat muscle. Um, and uh, you can use a latissimus morse site or the abdominis muscle. And that, if you do the latissimus abdominis, you can on this top.
tummy tummy, but you have to have plenty of tissue. Real skinny women can't do that. You can say that there's not enough to tissue to move up. But, but um, if you have a little bit of um, extra extra tummy fat, um, and then you can do the rectus muscle for the um, that type of surgery. And it, it really does look like a shark bite when you, um, I haven't actually seen the surgery, but, but I have seen um, slides from, there was one convert I went to, there were two different classes of surgeons that were showing slides of their procedure. It was just like a big goal, like a shark. to be able to, to, to do those particular motions. And most people start out kind of hunched over until they can um, you know, get therapy to, to, stand, to be able to stand up because it, it, is, it is really, really painful and it takes a lot. It is major, major surgery and it's, it certainly has more, more risks, but it has a, a much more um, aesthetic <coughs> There's, there's a lots of um, information in, in Iggy um, in Chapter 73, um, dash 4, dash 5, um, <coughs> charts, and then there's a, a table about post-op care after that. So y'all are going to put that. That's a really, really good picture. Okay. Let's see here. Get this. I'm going to talk about this one. Oh, no, no. Okay. Uh, this one's kind of hard to see here, but can you tell that? Well, yeah, I guess you can. You can see how how fat her her um, hand is on on the left. I guess it's her right arm. But um, if there is an action alert box on page sixty nine, right there, and it's right there. Suggestions at the bottom of the, the page. This it came from, or the, the notes page. It actually came from the concept book that we used last year. But that action alert box that y'all had a Nikki is good too. So that you know, look, look at both of those just so that you know the kinds of things you have to do. But what's the major thing we take care of a patient in the hospital? That, well, no, 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 what about if you go outside to garden? Like sunscreen and gloves. Let me say it like I'm Sunscreen and gloves. Sunscreen and gardening gloves. Yes, yes. And, and in particular, the, the gardening gloves. And be, be very careful. We're trying not to get get stuck or to be, be injured. You want to just be extra cautious with... Like, like cutting vegetables or anything like that, you need to be very, very careful with, with that to try not to get injured. So, um, and then the, the, the well, I said that this was in the old book, but this says it's from the National Cancer Institute website. So, well, sometimes their book puts it, um, so I'm not sure where I originally got it, but it's, you can get, get a lot more information um, from the NCI website. Okay, and this is, um, the breast reconstruction before the areola and the nipple were completed. You can see there's an incision, there's incisions. And if you look at it closely, you can tell she's been some damage too. But there, there's some incision areas here, and it's, it's, and, and they put the, the um, patient's own fat. Now sometimes, even if they do some of that other surgery, if they're if if the person was really 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 big in, in the breast and wants to, to stay the same size that, that she originally was and there's not enough tissue to, to make that. They sometimes they still will put a saline or silicone implant underneath the um the the uh, the muscle and uh, fat that they transfer to the parts of the body. And uh, the thing that's 
really nice. It looks like you didn't know, didn't I? The thing that's really nice about this surgery is the the nipple looks so so natural, and and they and sometimes they are able to save the nipple. They have ways of. Um, like cutting around the nipple and testing it to see if there's any any cancer actually in the nipple area and if there's not they'll take the nipple off and do the other stuff and put the real nipple back on they're able to do that in some cases but but sometimes they'll they'll take um, pigmented areas from other parts of the body like in the perineal area or something and, and get get some of the or labial area they can spare a little tissue there probably and and get um uh, make the, the nipple out of that and they they actually um, they twist up the skin and and, um, and do and sort of tattoo it a certain color or um, or put some sort of um, coloring on it so it will look like a real real nipple the skin color of the of the patient it's a real art it very much is an art I mean I, I think pla that's what plastic surgeons are first and foremost is, is artists they, they really really are it's like being um, Leonardo da Vinci or alone, but they, they may be used in addition if it's not something that would be um, that would counteract the, the treatment that you're doing. Like we talked about using the antioxidants and after having chemotherapy or radiation therapy, we want to oxidize the cells. That's what kills them um, in radiation and chemo. But um, the actual treatment and antioxidants to be good. Um, now, um, radiation therapy, um, is an adjunct to surgery um, a lot of times, and especially with, it's always done with, with um, uh, lumpectomies. Or I guess I can't ever say always, but almost always it's going to be with a lumpectomy. If it's an um, incitive cancer, they, maybe they won't, but um, but with, the, like my mom's was, was, her lump was right here, and then it took a little more tissue, and then they, they uh, took some more of those, uh, actually, more and, um, and it can be used to treat metastases, like my, my Aunt Martha's in Charleston, and she has um, uh, metastases to both of her hips, but um, one of them's hurting her a lot more, and so she's, she did it for to decrease the tumor in the, in the hip to begin with, but when she had recurrent pain, then they um, consulted again to, to suggest more radiation therapy to relieve the pain, because the bone the bones could take a lot more radiation, cumulative radiation, than our other tissues, and a lot of soft tissues. And sometimes um, they will do intraoperative radiotherapy with a, um, just a, a beam focused right onto the tumor, and, and it'll be like all of the, the one great big dose, the cumulative dose, right into that, that one tumor, instead of having to do the, the six week deal. And that way you're not scattering it so much to the other tissue that's just still all there to open up. They don't do that a whole lot, but, but on some, I'm sure some centers do that more than others. Having our little flesh of things that were going on. We, well, maybe it was too hot last week, but no, it's, it's not the case. Um, anyway, you can use radiation to shrink the tumor before surgery, sort of like that neoadjuvant chemotherapy. That, that happens sometimes. But sometimes it makes it hard to feel the, the, the tissue that's been radiated sometimes doesn't heal it. Well, so that's, that's a controversial sort of thing sometimes. Um, and Okay. One of the things that people are missing on a lot of the, the seniors' um, information for the, the, when they're doing their Kaplan plan for NCLEX is that um, is, is Reiki therapy. You know, we talked about Reiki therapy. I didn't even learn it is that when I was going through, um, you know, training to be an oncology nurse and all. We didn't really go to call it that. It was just like internal or implants or whatever. But Reiki versus Tele. So Tilly, you know that that means what? It's like from a distance, you know, it's not within you, it's, it's coming, the beam is coming from another source. But brachy therapy is when the source is within the patient. And so that's that's what you, you need to remember. Um, it's Tilly and brachy, and that, that's something that evidently increases is really jumping on that, even though it's not as often as the, the external beam therapy. They're, they're really 
um, beefing up the questions on that. There's on that um, focus review test, the oncology focus review test. There's like two questions out of thirty about breaking there. <coughs> I've been going through and looking to see what kind of senior they're doing, and I think that's kind of strange. But but I guess it's another thing. Anyway, that's when you actually have either the seed implants or the like needles where you the radiation source into the tumor. Um, the, the patient is radioactive when that source is inside the patient. It can be in the cervical cancer, prostate cancer, um, or, or breast, and, and probably others too. But, but they are um, they are using it um, more. They're saying it's getting to be like 10% of, of the, um, the radiation therapy. And it's probably at certain centers, though, where people are specialists. It's a balloon that they um, insert into the tumor area and then then load the load the balloon with the with the radiation source rather than like in a needle. So I don't know exactly how how that is, but it kind of sounds like hypoplasty or something where you go in with the balloon to, to build up the the um, spine kind of thing. So I guess that that kind of technology is just good to be good. So anyway, that's I just remember the the break. Really been blessing me that I haven't been teaching it, but I, I do, but it's just not the most common thing. I don't understand exactly why they're stressing that. I am not going to read this to you because you know they're going to be anxious. Um, you know that um, there's, there's going to be some things that you can do about that, explain it. You got to teach your patient, um, and then you're going to have some goals that they're going to express the feelings. Of, you know, that just like anxiety for, for any other condition of medical. Anyway, there, there can be some decisional conflict in all involved in a lot of this, um, and uh, in like how you're going to, to deal with things. Of course, um, y'all have had OR, and so this this is something that's really just a it's just along the lines of the OR information that, that Ms. Um, Walker taught you. But then on the, the notice page, we're talking about the decisional conflict. Just as like, what if I've got options? What am I going to do? My mom had options. I didn't ask it to me. Some people just want it. Like, it's y'all and I want it out, I'll just get it out of me. And then other people are like, well, if I, I can keep it, I'll, I'm going to keep it. And that's what my mom said. She well, she's still got it. So, and then um, the reach to recovery is something to, to remember the name of reach to recovery because some of the rehabilitation after having a mastectomy in particular is is to be able to, to raise your arm all the way. And and you have there's these exercises where you can put a um, rope up um, over a door and, and sort of pull back and forth to help get your range of motion back. And then and, and you kind of start um, doing this creeping up the wall sort of thing to a certain level until it really hurts and then you stop and then you try to just gradually um, get get higher and higher. But the um, reach to recovery is a mentor kind of thing where, where another um, breast cancer patient will um, will come in and, and hopefully somebody that has a very similar situation. They've been trained by American Cancer Society to how to talk to people and what not to say and all those kinds of things. And they know how they feel And that's why you call it the reach, because you're doing the climbing up the wall and you know, getting your arm reach normal again. So, okay. Um, and we've already talked about the take care of avoiding the, the uh, problems with the, um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> avoiding problems with the lymphedema arm or the, the possibility of having lymphedema in the arm. Um, you don't always have to have um, some people are more susceptible to it than others. Of course, the more um, lymph nodes that get cut out, the more the, the, the likely it is that there's not going to be as, as much drainage and, 
and that the body will try to establish like collateral um, circulation of the, of the lymphatic fluid, but some people, they just don't have enough potential for, for that, so, so they just have to be careful the rest of their lives. But, but what, what position would you want to have a woman in um, after they have a look at this section? Or, or even just a mastectomy with a sitting on the other side. What's that? Other side. Well, and, and what else? Right. Right. So right. So just like gravity help you. <coughs> gravity is just there. We might as well use it, you know. So, um, and that, that can certainly help. And sometimes you can use compression sleeves or, or ace wraps and, and such as, as well. But it is something that they have to be aware of <coughs> as well as if they've had um, both their dissections. But again, some people are more susceptible to it than others, but we just want to be very, very, very careful. So, and y'all can read there's, there's some interventions on there too. But, um, They'll elevate the affected arm higher than the shoulder, encourage range of motion in the affected arm, but not to the point of extreme pain, but, but just to uh, try to try to make progress um, um, gradually. And then uh, there are going to be the centers. So a lot of um, physical therapy centers to, um, to have machines that can help um, pump some of the fluid out. And so, so that can be a plus. Okay, and then disturb the body image. I don't think anybody has um, a lot of... Uh, Issues of understanding that, but there are sexual concerns, like I like said before, and on um, page 1609, it does talk about the, um, the sexuality part of it, and that you know, the nurse should, should broach the subject if the, if the patient does, because um, especially when the breast cancer, that's, that is an issue. Um, so, um, and then we want to encourage the woman to look at the decision, sort of like if you have a philosophy, you want to encourage when there's a body image change like that. Um, and uh, but, but, um, sometimes people are not ready immediately, but you don't want to, you don't want to encourage their um, denial to look at it or whatever, but, but you do, you can talk about it and everything, but you don't have to force them to do it. But um, you don't want to be enabling them to just um, continue denying that they have to so, and then they need to, to, if they haven't had any risk of reconstruction, any plans um, at the time of the surgery, they need to get some information about that and, and um, it's where they can be referred to. And there's also a um, um, Look Good, Feel Better program for patients on radiation or chemotherapy. It, it used to be um, officially a uh, um, American Cancer Society um, organization. But when I went to the website, look, it's lookgoodfeelbetter.org. It's not specifically on the, um, the American Cancer Society website. You can just Google it. So if you do lookgoodfeelbetter.org, it's really a neat thing. It's actually um, cosmetologists that have come together in some, some um, um, cosmetic companies that will donate. Um, and, and some other, some clothing companies will donate scarves and things like that, and and, um, and uh, the hairdressers and, and uh, people that, that do the nails and makeup and all this kind of thing um, uh, help the women that uh, to, to do their makeup to where they don't have a lot of hair. They can make up their eyes really pretty. Have you ever seen that a woman with no hair with just gorgeous makeup and you just you just look at her eyes and, and you don't really notice the hair? <laughs> Nowadays, that anything goes for hair anyway, pretty much. But, but um, you know, if that's if you're, if you're <coughs> doing what you yeah, there are some people that'll that'll uh, refuse to therapy because they don't want to lose their hair. And I think I told y'all that before, and that, that people would would sit in the swing and the wind would blow and the hair would blow off. And I'm telling y'all that in the other other um, unit then. Okay. All right, we're jumping jumping ahead. Right. And this. People were asking me if you had to know about the, the chest tubes. It just happened to be in that chapter. It was not in our chapter with the, the concept book, but that's just where Iggy chose to put it. I think it's a good thing that you read through it because we've had some, some patients with, with chest tubes. I actually didn't have a patient with chest tubes. Didn't you when you were with me? Didn't you have a patient oh, with yeah, chest tubes like your second day mm -hmm. or something like that? Yeah. And, um, and so it, it's really nice to know where that is in Iggy because if you have a patient that's got a chest tube and you know that on prep day, you can go to Iggy and find that out and you will have already read it before. It's not going to be like, oh my gosh, I never heard of this before. It, I think it's, it's a real good thing. But when you do have um, lung cancer surgery, there's a real likelihood that you're going to have a chest tube. So 
Um, but that I'm not going to teach more test students stuff because you really have to add another um, um, place in, in uh, the city of here when you're talking to the residents. Uh, but anyway, uh, where does it fall in the, in the uh, incidents? Like, how, how many? Number one. Yeah. Number one. Uh, no, number one. Yeah. It's number two in yeah. incidents for yeah. women and women, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what about, what about deaths? Number one, number one for, <laughs> for men or women? Both. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. But what's the number one cause of death? Heart disease. Heart disease. Heart disease. It's still tremendous, tremendous. And I, I was telling my clinical group that I read, and I've got this, let me just get this AARP article. Right now, it's in this around. It, it had, this one tells about good stuff to, to eat to beat cancer, but there's also an um, article about um, heart, uh, heart disease and how, um, <clears throat> how that is, is such a, it's like there's $170 million um, raised or spent on um, on heart disease for women um, because it is different in women. They do most of the research on, on medications and uh, procedures and everything on, on men. And they're going to be looking for women. But overall, these years, cumulatively, there's been a lot more research on men. So um, there, there's like 170 million dollars spent on the heart disease research, and like 685 million. Um, spent on, um, on the breast cancer. And, and it's just because breast cancer is a huge lobby that's been lobbied in Congress a lot. And then, then there's so many different organizations that raise money for it, which is, it's really a good thing. But they're saying that mm -hmm. by, by far, um, more people die from heart disease than the breast cancer. It doesn't mean that we don't want to know about breast cancer. That doesn't mean we want to spend less on breast cancer. We just need to spend more on the heart disease, too. So. Anyway, but there's no, there's no good time of when people actually only when they're jumping from breast cancer to lung. Um, we had, had several patients you know, over the years, and I was there going for 24 years in that clinic, so I guess I saw a lot of people. But we had some breast cancer patients that really struggled through their chemo chemotherapy, but then they, you know, they they had a long period of, of no no recurrent disease or anything like that. Never had recurrence of the breast cancer. But they kept on smoking and smoking and smoking and smoking. And, and um, um, the doctor, you know, Dr. Black in particular, he was very, um, he's very uh, terse about everything and, and uh, to the point. But, but um, he says, Francis, you know what, you're, you're keeping on smoking. Um, it's like, uh, like driving 150 miles an hour around um, uh, on a curvy road with a plastic Jesus hanging from, from your uh, rear view mirror. I mean, if you if you can't, you know, if you can't do what you need to do to, to keep yourself safe, then you know. And, and we had we had some of those people die of lung cancer, that and, and they had already battled their breast cancer so hard, and they ended up dying of lung cancer. So, just, just, right. and, and I know it's, it's got to be so hard to, to quit, especially with the stress of having breast cancer and fever. But but it's just so sad to see that happen. Um, but. Anyway, um, we have, we're going to mainly just say small cell lung cancer. Sometimes they call it oat cell because it looks like an oat under the microscope. And then um, the non-small cell is the, um, the, um, the uh, adeno and the large cell and squamous cell. So, but anyway, all lung cancers tend to be aggressive and locally invasive and have widespread metastatic lesions. And, um, and, um, have this, like, damage on here, anyway, um, all the problems uh, spread to be in the lymphatic system. If you look at a uh, model of the lymphatic system, you'll see that there's so many lymph node chains in the chest, and it's just hard to escape lymphatic spread. So, and then um, the, the other organs like brain and bones and liver. I, I saw this article a long time ago, and, and it seems like it, it really is true that. Um, if you already have, if you have cancer in your lungs, there's some sort of metastatic pathway that that makes it easier for it to go from the lung to the brain. Like if you have breast cancer that goes to the lung, you're, you're more likely to have it go to the brain too if it goes to the lung first. And I really didn't see that after I read that article. I really noticed that the, the, well, it doesn't usually go straight to the brain anyway. It goes to the lung first and then to the brain. So, um, sometimes the first incidence of 
where the first symptom or manifestation of lung cancer is like a seizure or something like that, and it's already spread to the brain because it, it can be, um, the, especially the small cell, but now any of the lung cancers could spread there, but the small cells really, really bad to be uh, You can have this great response rate because the small cell grows really, really quickly. So it's got that high mitotic index, and the high mitotic index is very, very responsive to radiation therapy. Chemotherapy, radiation therapy, go after um, the, the rapidly dividing cells. And so that's, that's what we got here with small cell. But then it comes back, it recurs just, just with a vengeance um, most of the time. There, occasionally, I have seen a few people that had sort of peripheral um, small cell tumors, and they actually did have surgery for that, and then, then went through the chemotherapy and everything, and they did have some wall response. Actually, I think it was a that was one of the, the person that uh, Dr. Black was talking about, the classic Jesus. She actually had um, lung cancer surgery and was in her mission for several years, um, and then did um, her, her um, and, and the chief she's in that kind of So anyway, and you don't have to remember about this chromosome thing, but just know all cancers are genetic in some way, not necessarily that hereditary genetic, some of them can be, but this, the tendencies sometimes can be um, uh, that you're, you're born with, but not so much with lung cancer. It is mainly an environmentally caused um, um, issue. And if you've got that chromosomal abnormality too, then that's, that's really bad news. Okay. Um, and then here's our, here's our little, little oats. They may not be quite as easy to see, but they call them, since they're really tiny little cells, they're, they're the oat cells. And they're usually in that hyalur area or mediastinal area of the, of the lung. Like So you've got your esophagus and your, and your trachea and your bronchial tubes and everything are um, affected in there. And you can just see it's, it's real shadowy there, there in the middle. It's not so obvious where your esophagus and everything is. So it's a central region. Um, and then the, the syndrome of inappropriate ADH, if y'all have been the HESI, you, you know about that. And then the Cushing syndrome, you can have the CTH that, that um, comes um, from the dream of land um, as well. And uh, then that's that pure stuff. Okay, so that's the hormones that, that um, can be uh, encouraged to be produced or, or released into the system. And it's really, really, really aggressive, and it can, like, 40% have distant metastasis when they're not in the All right, and then the, um, this is a, a picture of a, um, a, a peripheral one. Um, it's not, not really as evident on, on here, but it, you can see, you can see there's, there's, uh, in, it, it's in the, in the periphery, so. Um, no, this is, yeah, I'm sorry, that's a, that's like a, or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a good radiologist thing, but this, this is where the, the tumor actually is. So, um, yeah, that's why I always tell my clinical students to go go to the, the impression first, the written impression by the doctor, then go look at the x-ray. Sometimes you can tell like, like Taylor's gallstones. That was very obvious <laughs> with his patients. Um, it's not always as obvious to us that we're not going to know what we're saying. Anyway, um, it can occur in non-smokers. And remember Christopher Reeve, the, the first Superman guy, the most, the more recent one anyway, the, the, um, the first Superman remake movie. Um, his wife ended up dying too. He died, he got, um, he had a kid fall off a horse and you know, had a cervical vertebrae issue and all that. And then and he died and then she died of adenocarcinoma of the lung never smoked. So it can be from, um, they think it, it might be, um, it even can be in, in smoke stage too, so it's not as much as it is in smoke stage. But, um, it, it can be, but it's not as much as the other ones. Um, and it's, it can be a peripheral mass in, um, in the bronchi and uh, it can be um, sitting and, and all that, but for like a chronic, like a COPD or it can cause like a COPD. Um, so like I said on here on this notes page, just know that there's small cell and non-small cell and that the small cell just grows faster and it's usually um, almost always in the center of the chest, but the not the other. So anyway, and, and the, the large cell would sometimes be like on TV or they, they may put them on TV precautions until they rule it out, until they do a biopsy and make sure. Because if it is, if it's only cancer and it's not TV, then you don't have to have an isolation. 
certainly, but it does cavitate like a TV region where it's sometimes set. Well, I think we know our, uh, a lot of our risk factors here. Uh, and age is your biggest risk factor um, that you can't control. You know. And then if you got personal and family history, um, the cigarette smoke is the most significant, of course, 10 times more common than the smokers. And y'all did a great job in your um, health promotion project with the know that cigarette smoke is an initiator and a promoter of lung cancer. I think we talked about that in the other course, but, but that's, remember that. It is an initiator. So it can make the first um, uh, irreversible change in the DNA, but it also, if you keep doing it, then it, it promotes the lung Spaces and everything, and sometimes that's the that's the drawback of having a real energy efficient house. If you've got um, radon um, coming into your house, because that that way you don't have any escape route for it. If you've got a real tight house, so make sure you got a real energy efficient house that you um, encourage encourage your patients to check for the radon and do it yourself too. All right, so our manifestations depend on where it is in the lungs and, and maybe where it's spread to as well. Um, it may, it may seem like um, chronic bronchitis to begin with. Um, and then, of course, the procedures or phone tests, all these kind of things, then sometimes you back up and see what the primary cause was. And there's some information on that on page 631. Um, in so, um, let's see, table 32 1 talks about the perineoplastic, um, things that can, the, the endocrine um, disruptors and everything that can, can happen with. ACTH and um, ADH, and da, 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 da. you got liver effects that can spread to the liver. So what are we going to see with liver? No, no, no. No. And maybe that might make it swell and then right up the blood. <coughs> so, and then of course cough and lots of mucus and shortness of breath and shortness and uh, um, bleeding from coughing up blood and um, and chest pain and. Um, one thing that they did actually mention this in TV, but it wasn't in the concept book, that you may have episodes or maybe recurrent pneumonia. That's what Iggy says, is recurrent episodes of pneumonia. But I've seen people that, that had a clear chest x-ray in January, and like in April, they had small cell lung cancer. They came into the hospital with a real severe case of pneumonia, got antibiotics, got some of the inflammation down, and then there's, they, could get, they could really see the tumor in their cultures. small cell and non-small cell. They, they have um, multiple kinds of, of cells, and that's, that's really wacko to come to, to try to treat, too, uh, because it is a little bit different. You, you have a more aggressive chemotherapy regimen with um, the small cell since it's, um, it's more responsive. But um, you want to do some aggressive radiation maybe, um, to the tumor area with, um, with this non-small cell, or maybe you want to remove it. But if you've got small cell, it's, it's considered a systemic disease, even if it's not sleeping in this anesthetic area, just because my body brain is so really consider it a systemic disease to begin with, but, but not necessarily the non-small cell. So that's the thing that's really, really scary and hard to, to make decisions. So, um, okay. And of course, we want to prevent. I think we all we all know this, and I'll, I'll let y'all look at that, the way that you um, that you diagnose it, and everything. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, depends on where it is as to what you're going to do for the. Um, depends on the manifestations and all that. So, okay, we do we do drug therapy, surgery, and radiation therapy. Sometimes you use um, all of them, 
and um, sometimes you use them. You get have surgery and then do the um, do the chemotherapy or with, with like adenocarcinoma. Sometimes you do that, um, but most of the time you start with chemotherapy with small cell because but they may do radiation therapy just to shrink it because of the symptoms as well. Sometimes it is a symptom reliever and you you need to do that right away. Or if they're having um, the brain metastasis, you need to, to radiate that um, right away as well because that's not going to a lot, a lot of chemotherapy drugs, or most chemotherapy drugs, don't pass the, the blood-brain barrier, so um, chemotherapy is not going to help a whole bunch. So, anyway, we have to relieve pain if, if necessary, and that, and that sort of thing, and as well. Most of the time, it's more of a breathing thing, but it certainly can be um, extreme pain as well. And then you can do the brachytherapy with with this also. Um, and, and do, do some, some implants um, in, into the, the tumor if, if they're large cell or the, um, they could, you would use teletherapy, I think, always with the small cell, but the non-small cell, they may be able to use the brachytherapy with the, the seed implants and all that. Um, the other thing, and I, I do want you to just look at the kinds of surgeries that you can have for, for um, lung cancer. The, you know, the segmental resection is, is just a, like a, a, a part of a lobe or a lobe a wedge resection of um, a pneumonectomy is, your, is taking a whole lung out. And just know what those terms mean. Um, and, and then, um, uh, and that's on page 634. And uh, there's a, a great post-doc care section. And again, it, it ends up talking about the, the chest tubes. But the general post-doc care for, um, for uh, lung cancer surgery, I want you to, to read up um, through all of that. Um, and one thing about the radiation therapy, especially when, when they're in the mediastinal area, the radiation's in the mediastinal area, what else is in there that's going to be just right, right in the path of the radiation? <coughs> yeah, your esophagus definitely is. And, and so what do you think is going to be a, a problem, um, maybe with nutrition? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to swallow when you get, you did not really have a raw, raw esophagus, esophagitis, this tremendous esophagitis, and narrowing from the inflammation that it's produced too. And so um, sometimes people have to have feeding tubes and, and all. You have to, to really um, assess for the, the need for that. But, but uh, just because somebody's having the, um, you think about respiratory tract symptoms, of course you're going to have respiratory tract symptoms possibly with their trachea and all that too. But, but um, it, it really does seem wrong to sort of open up the, the airways if you're, if you're um, pulling the cancer cells and you're dividing so pretty much and everything. What you may have more side effects with is the, is the GI tract of the esophagus. So just remember that, that that's a sort of a peripheral thing that's that's really important and can certainly be um, um, eventually life threatening if we can't get any nutrition at all. Of course, we could do TPN or something, but, but we want to um, to watch that and, and um, if they're having trouble swallowing, we need to give them a break from radiation therapy for a few days to see what we get and get things to, to um, straighten down a little bit without having to be so aggressive. We certainly can do all right, and if y'all have had your respiratory unit, so I'm not going to go through all of that because y'all know, know about these, these kinds of things, what to do for respiratory patients. It's, this is where the stuff starts to get repetitive for you and for um, activity and calm, for um, have the rest periods and activities and, and um, <coughs> chronic and acute pain. We need, uh, you know, we've already talked about the pain situation, so we're going to um, deal with that. Um, if, However, we need to the 24-hour medication schedule, especially if it's a, um, a, a chronic kind of pain. All right, and then the anticipatory breathing. You talked about that with with Ms. Rumble a little bit, you guys, um, and that was part of your um, your psych content. So, so that's not something new either. So, um, let y'all read that part. It really makes this kind of sense so that they have a you know, baseline um, information about it. So. Okay, I've got so much cool stuff about skin cancer and all this, and we just don't have time to do it right now. I'm probably going to send some of the stuff around. It seems like we have more time in the second <coughs> second slot for our, I don't know why it's, it's like that, but we got more time, so I'll probably send around a bunch of other stuff about um, tanning beds and all that sort of thing, because we're not going to have time today, obviously. We're really all right, so skin cancer, no, 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 no. And the, the, the skin coloring material, that melanin, is where we have the problem. <laughs> so, um, 
the melanoma called the 79 percent of the deaths from skin cancer and the incidence is increasing. And when we look at those American Cancer Society statistics, actually non-melanoma skin cancers are the, the greatest incidence for both men and women. But that's that's what it says on the on the, the chart that it's non-melanoma skin cancer, which is the, the one the, the rest of prostate and colon being the, the main non-melanoma. <laughs> not as frequent as any of those, but it certainly is deadly, potentially deadly. So, um, and what, what you need to know that is that your skin remembers every ultraviolet light exposure for about your whole life, um, and so exposures as a child can influence the risk of skin cancer uh, way into adulthood, um, and it's sensitive to damage from UVA and UVB, and what they're saying is, and uh, I'll do the spoiler thing with the um, pan beds is that there's a, a tremendous increase in UVA exposure from tannin bed and there is from um, for regular sun exposure. So, so that's where um, some people are, are uh, having a tremendous risk of uh, developing one another. Do they not have a frequent? No, non melanoma is the most frequent. And that's what's on that chart that where we have the breast cancer and the, and the other unit. Um, if you go back to the, the PowerPoints from 112, um, it did have statistics of a clear melanoma was on the list, but it's not a it's not very popular list as far as the number of cases. But it's growing because uh, uh, of the, the, uh, um, the way our environment is getting affected and everything, the ozone layer and all that, that's, that's an issue. But people with, with really um, with red, red hair, real light colored eyes, reddish or blondish hair, um, English, they call it Celtic descent, um, and like me, <laughs> Dr. Siegler at, at Duke, they, they used to do um, uh, treatments to, to do mel kill melanoma cells, and BCG that you, you use for um, uh, the, the TV, the drug immune system, and um, he, he would inject that as immunotherapy um, for his melanoma patients. I went to the observe his clinic one day and there was this older woman in there and I was like 22 or something like that. And um, I was just observing and he and he asked this lady, he said, Well, um, what did your skin look like when when uh, when you were younger? Did it look like her? And I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> that's that's a little scary. So but but um you do have to realize that it can happen to anybody and actually I've seen some African American people. I saw one man retinal melanoma that was African American and then there was a woman that I mean she was she was a um, Caucasian woman she had melanoma in her vagina. So I don't think the sun was there unless the sun was One of her therapies was she had to take a candle to keep her vagina dilated. If she did, she'd have to lubricate the candle and, and um, keep, keep her vagina dilated. That's what she was doing. She could put it. 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 I am not, I, I have a lot of stuff about these, these very specific kinds of melanomas, so we're not going to be real, real um, upset about that. I just want you to realize that there are lots and lots of categorizations for it. And, and um, um, when you have a lot of congenital nevi, moles present at birth, that's a risk factor. Um, and then the dysplastic nevi, they're not present at birth, but they, they look like moles during childhood, but they'll, they'll change. And um, Robert's had several of them. He didn't want to go to the... the um, dermatologist anymore because he keeps getting stuff whacked off of his back and all and he didn't like to do that but um, this is just a different kind this tan or black patch it just looks a little bit different so that you don't have to really remember that part but they just know that there are different um, categories. Be on the the, not that no that the name that name is not good it's going to be just basically basic melanoma risk and basic melanoma care and this back and forth. So, so that's what 
that's a Okay, now this is important too, that you have, can have a radial growth phase where it's just going across the surface that can last one to 25 years. So it's just parallel to the skin surface and it, surface and it doesn't go, that's not metastasis because it's just sort of expanding, it's sort of doing it by expansion. But then uh, you, can, you can cure it at that point by surgical excision a lot of times. But if it starts going down, that's when it, uh, and going towards your, your lymph nodes and your, and your blood vessels, that's when it's an issue. So. Um, So this is a, the A, you need to know this. You need to know what the ABCD stands for. And this is asymmetry. And, okay, and you can have, um, and this has, this talks about, um, I keep saying stuff beforehand and then I get to it on my, on my notes and it's already done. But it is in light-skinned races and greater than 60-year-olds and exposure to arsenic or other carcinogenic chemicals in addition to, to um, UV light is, is a, a big risk. And here we are, borders. Sometimes you're going to have multiple things in one, one tumor, but, but that's, that's the borders are irregular. It's not just a little round thing. Okay. Oops, I'm just going to... There we go. And color, that there's a variation in the color. Some of the other ones were too, weren't they? You can just sort of see that. So um, this is sort of like when you're talking about diamonds, the color cut and clarity and carrot and all that stuff, except it's all seeds for that. But, but, um, but we do the ABCDE, that's what we're after here. Okay, and then the D is diameter, and it's this six millimeters, and people always say, well, it's the size of a pencil eraser. I don't know why you don't just say that in the first place, because we don't really have a, a concept of what six millimeters is. But that's, that's pretty neat to know that, isn't it? And if it's, if it's that size, at least, um, then you, um, you want to have it checked out. So um, we, um, we, that's, that's what we're looking at with the melanomas. Oh, I can um, basal cell cancers, um, the, again, there's all those different kinds. You don't have to know all those different kinds, so don't, don't worry about that. It's just that the, know that there are varieties in it. I, I get these Medscape things and say, can you, can you identify these particular skin cancers? And it's like, you're supposed to do all that. Like, unless you're a dermatologist, how in the world are you going to know that? I, I just kind of went over my head. So anyway, um, just realize that if you're... Um, they are the least aggressive, and they're, they rarely metastasize. They grow by direct extension mostly and destroy the surrounding tissue. You can see some really nasty-looking basal cells. You probably have seen them before, and especially in older people that have had a lot of sun exposure in their life. And the big thing about it is even if you cut it off, it can tend to recur because your skin's damaged. You know, you had the sun exposure, and the, and the skin's still damaged, and so you still can, can have them uh, come back or, or come in another place. And if you don't do anything about them, though, especially if they're um, greater than two centimeters, that's pretty big. You know, that's almost an inch, and it? Well, let's get close to an inch in diameter. And it can destroy body parts, like your nose or your eyelid, if, if you don't trick it. And then we got some pictures of some basal cells. And I, I really have a hard time distinguishing, for sure. I'd rather, I'd rather have somebody that... Um, Really, that's what they're doing to, to go with that voice. But anyway, our um, we, our squamous cell is is areas of skin exposed to UV rays. Of course, there's the other ones are too. It's more aggressive than basal cell, but it's much less aggressive than, than melanoma. So, um, and it, this is where you, you do have the actinic keratoses can can develop into the, the, the you do have that discussed in your in your book, and it has has pictures of it and everything. So in areas of sun exposure, like your ear, your forehead, the top of your head if you're bolder, your forehead if you've got a high forehead. So um, um, it is from, from uh, sun damage. And you can, um, the enlargement or ulceration um, 
suggests that the actinic keratoses are transforming to, to um, malignancy. So if you do have those, those keratoses or people in your family, the older people in your family have, have them, um, to keep an eye on them, do skin checks and, and see if they're getting larger and, and kind of keep a baseline, take note if there's something wrong. And that's a real scaly um, lesion, but that's actually on a finger and that, that's a, a, actually a squamous cell. It's not just a keratosis anymore. Keratosis, a lot of times, will, if they, they kind of itch and they, they scab up or, or they get real dry and then they, they sort of flake off. If you scratch them off, it'll bleed and then it'll, be, they'll, it'll look a little clear for a while and then it'll come back to get the scaliness and all that. And so it, it's, um, and if it, if it starts to grow in that process, that's when you've got to be careful. So, um, and I think we've already got, we've already said all of this stuff. So, um, UV radiation, UV, UVB is absorbed by the top layer of skin, UVA penetrates, penetrates deeper into the skin layers causing tissue damage. That's why it's so dangerous with the tanning beds because it's more, lots and lots, lots more um, UVA that goes way deep into your skin. So, um, and that can uh, suppress the T cell and B cell immunity. It's very, and melanoma is very much related to immunity and that's why they, they are given the um, that um, the kill melanoma cells and the BCG to rev up the immunity because that that can kill some melanomas and there there are it's like one percent of melanomas um, like meta, even metastatic melanomas can be um, can be cured um, just just spontaneously that's the very they said like one percent of all malignancies can just <coughs> even if they're spread somewhere else could be can be cured just spontaneously, but, but it's probably the immune system revving up, maybe for some other reason. Um, maybe you have an infection and it's revving up and it ends up killing some of the cancer cells and, and it's uh, along with, I think I told you that about my friend that had the, the uh, liver metastasis and, and she had C. diff and when she was fighting the C. diff, her cancer disappeared in, in the liver and it's, it's never come back. I have to knock on wood and say a prayer because it's been a miracle. I mean, it's really a miracle. You just don't see that. It's just not, not often, but she must be one of those one percenters. So anyway, but uh, the melanoma has the most incidence of those spontaneous cures. Um, but it's not that many, but it happens. Okay, and then um, uh, I, I want to look at those surgeries that I put on this um, this collaboration sheet, the, the notes page, the cry, what cryo surgery is, and what's cryo? It's cold, freezing, yes, and, and then curatage and the uh, electro desiccation. Desiccation means to, like dry it out, right? The, you have those little desiccators that they put in your shoes so they don't get moisture in them and stuff like that. So what desiccate means is to keep it dry. But then uh, if, you, if you do, you cut it and you cut it off and then, then um, use a, a, a electric uh, probe and, and, and totally dry it up in the, in the whole uh, margin. And then a, just a basic biopsy excision, just take it all out. And then that, that Mohs surgery is something that they've been talking about that students don't know much about. And I didn't really emphasize that last year, but I saw that on the list, that Mohs surgery. That's when you actually take just tiny layers and then check. Take another tiny layer and then check until you get a clear margin so that you don't have, especially if it's in an area where you don't want to be disfigured. Um, you just ta it, it takes a really long time, but it has a much better um, outlook uh, uh, as far as our outcome for, for appearance and body image and, and all that. And, and it doesn't have to be as extensive either if you could just, just take the layer that's, you know, that, that's going to be um, clear when you first get a clear layer, maybe they'll go down a couple more just in case, but they, at least they know they don't have to take, take a big gouge. Um, with, and that's not usually with melanoma though. Melanoma, they do gouge. They're going to gouge a lot. <laughs> and get, they, you can have these big pits in your arm or your pit or wherever it ends up being. But, but um, some of the other, like basal cells and, and uh, squamous cells, they can do, do the, the most surgery. Um, okay, so we do just be aware of those. And then this shows you how the, the levels are to, to um, tell the level of risk for, um, for melanoma. They call it Clark levels. And so that level one is just the very superficial, and then level two and three is, is down into the uh, into the dermis, and level level four is even further into the dermis, and then level five even gets to the the, um, the subcutaneous tissue. But level four is where blood vessels are too. So well, even two and three, there's some blood vessels here. So level one is the best place to be, of course. But um, and when you start getting down to level five, it's very very likely to be metastatic. So anyway, um. 
look at all that uh, preventing skin cancer stuff that I've got. Uh, you probably already know this, but, but read it anyway on, the, um, on this notes page because that's, that's very important for, for teaching. And our diagnostic test, I think that's pretty um, obvious as, as well. But you do have to, with the micro staging with melanoma, look at that level. There, Clark's level, and there's some other, there's some other um, staging systems, but Clark's is more the most common. So I would just, just look at the one. You don't have to memorize that, but just realize that the level one's the the most favorable. And level five's the least. Just like most anything else we're talking about with cancer, the, the higher the number, the worse it is. So. And then our treatment, surgery, wide excision, <coughs> excision, immunotherapy, radiation therapy. We don't see radiation so much, but some melanomas are, are really sensitive to radiation. So you, you do see that sometimes. Um, and you can't, the immunotherapy is usually interferon. You remember interferon from our, and I told y'all to know that one, right? So, and then, um, of course, we're going to have impaired skin integrity, and we know how to deal with that. Um, and we can talk about the hopelessness when you know that it's metastatic or you're worried that it's metastatic. That's more like anticipatory grief but, and anxiety and all that. It, it, there's so many of those, those psychosocial things you could put, but that one's certainly a possibility. And the anxiety and, and the good listener and all that sort of thing. So I'm, I know I'm rushing this, but I do want to show you if I can get a slide more.